Ah, the humble sidewinder. Every commander's first ship, and one of the tiniest and least powerful ships in the game. Yet, in the right hands, and with extensive engineering, it is quite capable of holding its own even in the endgame content of Elite Dangerous, Fargoid Interceptor Combat. Today, you'll be watching something that has never been done before, and that before the arrival of the so-called salvation weapons was widely considered to be impossible. I'll be showing you a lone Sidewinder taking down the hardest NPC in the game, a Fargoid Hydra-class Interceptor. Feel free to keep listening for an intro to the fight, or if you'd like to get straight into the action, you can also jump ahead to the next chapter in the video. The Sidewinder as a fighting ship inevitably comes with its own limitations. It has limited firepower, with only two small hardpoints. It has limited energy regeneration, with a class 1 power distributor, which is the smallest in the game. It is quite fragile in terms of hull health. The version I used has 720 HP, which is not a lot. And it's not very customizable, given that it only has 4 class 1 and 2 class 2 optional internal slots. On the flip side, the Sidewinder also has some remarkable strengths. It is very fast, with good acceleration. It is quite maneuverable. It has a tiny silhouette, which helps immensely with avoiding damage. It has two utility slots, and while that may not sound like much, consider it's literally twice as many as its sibling, the Eagle. And last, but not least, it's dirt cheap making rebuys a non-issue, unless you are truly broke. To date, the hardest Fargoid interceptive variant that was taken down in a Sidewinder was a Fargoid Medusa. And even then, only two commanders ever managed that fight. Commander Maligno, who was the first one to do it, and to whom my ship's name is dedicated, and myself. With just two traditional small Guardian Gauss cannons, taking on a Hydra in a Sidewinder was widely viewed as impossible. While it is mathematically possible, the fact that the amount of damage you'd be doing is so close to the natural regeneration of the Hydra meant that the fight wasn't really humanly doable. With a Salvation storyline, a new class of modified Guardian Gauss cannons was introduced. We call them Hammer Gauss, as they resemble the burst fire of Imperial Hammer railguns. Using just basic ammunition, the Hammer Gauss are a net downgrade in pretty much every way to traditional Garden Gauss cannons. While their nominal damage remains the same, their range is quite a bit shorter and you need to keep them on target longer to land the full burst. Their only real benefit is that their heat doesn't spike as much as regular Gauss, and honestly, that isn't that big of a benefit. Everything changes when you load premium ammo into them. Because of a bug in how the game calculates the damage bonus of premium ammo, the Hammer Gauss get a whopping plus 120% damage instead of a regular plus 30% damage that you'd normally expect. The result is that with two premium loaded small Hammer Gauss, your little Sidewinder will be doing as much damage as if it was firing almost five of the traditional small Gauss with basic ammo. It still isn't a lot. Most Hydra fights are done with much more DPS than that. But now, for the first time, it is enough to take on a Hydra. Fewer than about 200 commanders have ever taken on a Hydra in solo combat and emerged victorious. Of those who did succeed, most will have done so in a Chieftain or in a Crate Mark II. To date, the smallest ship to have managed it is a Viper Mark III piloted by Commander Katie Byrne. It is time to add a Sidewinder to that list. Note that, while this fight makes use entirely of mechanics which exist in-game and Fuzz is not cheating, it does take advantage of a bug in the way ammo synthesis works, and thus this kind of fight would not be allowed for ranks in the Anti-Xeno initiative. What follows is a narrated set of highlights of an almost hour-long fight. In case you'd like to see the full unedited version, it is linked below. Time for interceptor combat.
The start of this fight is typical of how you'd normally engage an interceptor, but with a couple of notable differences. First of all, I will start synthing heat sinks before I even open fire. That will allow me to have an additional heat sink reloaded by the time I've expended my first one. Those additional 10 seconds of heat sink coverage time can make or break a run in some instances. I will also try to keep my orbits tighter than usual. Hammergoss has a fall off range of only 1200 meters as compared to the 1500 meters of traditional Gauss. You need a tighter orbit to maximize damage with a Hammergoss. The first heart went pretty well. I took minimal damage. Now is the time to repair, rearm, and wait out shield decay before re engaging. The shield decay timer on a Hydra is 5 minutes and 20 seconds. That gives us plenty of time to do all of the aforementioned. Notice that I have to retract my hard points to free up enough power to run my AFMU. Since we're not going to be shooting at anything in this phase, Storing hard points is not a problem, we can do so safely. In between each heart I'll be repairing my Holland modules, simping heat sinks, replacing limpets if needed, and in every couple of hearts also simping ammo. Time to engage the second heart. Deploying hard points, switching pips to their combat setting of 1, 2, 3, and beginning an orbital insertion maneuver. I'll need to be careful on approach not to fly through the swarm because that would agitate it. A so called agitated swarm has a bad habit of shooting missiles at you. Considering how fragile the sidewinder is, we want to make sure that doesn't happen, as swallowing a missile volley would all but guarantee a quick trip to the rebuy screen. Just like I did with the first heart, I will start sniffing a heatsink before I engage in order to get those additional 10 seconds of coverage time. The orbital insertion went well. I managed to get the Hydra exactly where I wanted it, close to the ideal 1200 meters of hammer gauss fall off, yet still a safe distance beyond 800 meters, which is the lightning trigger range. I do subsequently realize that I am getting too close and decide to boost and swing past it. This is a risky emergency evasive maneuver. You'll notice that the gourd starts glowing, which means I triggered lightning, but fortunately, I managed to get out of range faster than the gourd can fire its special attack. Getting captured by lightning even just once would spell immediate game over in this fight. The Sidewinder is too weak to survive it, and even if it somehow managed to, the swarm would quickly finish me off. The fight will get easier as it progresses because the remaining health of the Goid is what determines how difficult it is to exert each heart. For any interceptor variant, the second heart is overall the hardest to destroy, which is why I crafted the saying, if you can destroy the second heart, you can finish the fight. Lightning is active, which is not the case for the first heart, and the Goid still has a lot of health, which means that getting the heart to exert will take a lot of shooting. Now having exerted the heart, notice something interesting. The aiming dots of a small hammer gauss almost magically snap into place when they get close enough to a module that targeted ship. 
we call this effect Micro Gimbal. Curiously, it is only present on small Gauss cannons. Medium-sized Gauss cannons somehow do not come with Micro Gimbals. While not hugely influential, Micro Gimbals are still quite helpful. They allow you to more easily pinpoint the exact location you need to aim at, and let you immediately recognize if you're landing your shots or not. And the second heart is down. I ended up taking a good deal of damage at the end. That's because I ran out of heat sinks. Fortunately, I had the additional heat sink from the initial synth, otherwise I would have run out of time and likely have been destroyed. In those few seconds through which I came under direct fire, I managed to eat a volley and a half of Hydra cannon rounds which wiped out 40% of my hull. It shows you just how fragile the ship is, and how absolutely devastating Hydra Mania cannon fire can be if you can't manage to avoid it. Just like after the first heart, now is the time to repair and reload. In this case we will also rearm as we are running low on ammo. Now, because of the same bug that affects damage on the Hammer Gauss, the amount of ammo that is restocked with premiums is also bugged. You only get 80 rounds back if you synth premiums. However, if you synth basic ammo, you get the full 400 rounds back. Which is why you'll see me do something pretty odd in this run. I will first synth basic ammo, which gives me the 400 total back, and then I will synth premium on top, which gives me a full 400 rounds of premium ammo. That is much more material efficient than synthing just premium ammo, as I would need to synth 5 loads of premium ammo to get the full 400 back. I would also not have enough materials to do the entire fight. Time for heart number 3. I'm again synthing heat sinks before I engaged. You may have noticed, or heard, that's what the occasional beeping noise is, that some of my friends on Discord from the Anticino Initiative have started watching my stream at this point. I have muted and deafened myself as, while I love my friends, they can be somewhat distracting for a fight that requires this level of focus and intensity. So far it's going well. See how every now and then the Hydra turns around and away from you before turning back towards you. That's what we call a Goid Rearm. The Hydra has the shortest rearm cycle of all Fargoid interceptors. It makes it somewhat tricky to orbit. But the rearm cycle is also the shortest in duration, which makes chasing it comparatively easier. The second rearm I am pretty far away, so I decide to boost towards it and try to close the range, which I managed to do right before I get the observe. A Hydra's heart can be hard to visually identify. My preferred cue are the three flashing dots which appear when it is exerted. The heart is located pretty much on top of the outermost of those three. With a bit of practice, that cue becomes unmistakable. And the heart is down, again with somewhat minimal damage. Parts 4 through 8 included are pretty much more of the same. I'll let you watch with limited additional narration. I will just explain the mistakes I made tackling the subsequent hearts. The initial approach to heart 4 shows what I call a failed insertion. I end up with a swarm right in front of me and with a goy too far away to properly damage it. Rather than painfully trying to adjust my orbit, wasting precious sync coverage time, I decide to abort the run and just try again.
I make a mistake, and a large enough one to prompt me to hit the abort button on the run. What happened was that I let myself get too close to the Goy during its rearm. When the Goy turned back towards me and boosted, it became clear that it was going to catch me in lightning range. I was left with no choice but to boost straight at it to swing past it to avoid lightning, which I did. But that also placed me too far away to shoot and wrecked my orbit. A common mistake less experienced commanders make at this point is to boost again towards it to try and salvage their run. It almost never works. The most common outcome is that they start jousting the Goid while doing little to no damage as proper rage control becomes all but impossible in that situation. The correct course of action in this scenario is to abort the run, restore your sinks, and try again.
I make a big mistake on approach to heart 7. I end up flying straight through the swarm. All too aware of what I had just done, I initially tried to tiptoe my way into salvaging the run by adjusting my orbit as far away as possible from the swarm. The incoming missiles warning brings me back to my senses and makes me decide wisely to abort the run, fly back through the swarm to reset it, and try again. Okay, so all hearts have been destroyed. All that is left to do is wait out the final shield and move in for a kill. The far great hull at this point no longer regenerates. You can take your time and be a bit more careful. By this time I was quite tired after the hour long fight. My hands were shaking from the adrenaline. I committed to taking it really easy as the last thing I wanted to happen was to get too close, get zapped by lightning and lose the fight at the very end. I also decided to send ammo again, even though I might have had enough to finish the fight. I really didn't want to take any chances. So, sent the ammo, waited out the final shield, and with the intent to be very careful and keep my distance, 
I move in for a final round of fight. And with that death animation, that explosion, and that bond, we have the first ever kill of a far great Hydra in the humble Sidewinder. A 60 million bond with a ship that has a rebuy of about 100,000. That's 600 times worth of rebuys from a single bond. This is my third serious attempt at this fight, so the profit margin is pretty good. The previous couple of fights ended prematurely when 128 enraged Fargon missiles decided to nuke my paper hull. I'm very excited to have managed this kill. It's fair to say it's one of the fights that I'm the most proud of. I'm sort of disappointed about the fact that it was only possible because of the ammo bug of the Hammer Goss, but alas, this is currently what we have in game, and on the other hand, I'm glad that it was possible at all. I also decided to go and pick up the heart of the Interceptor. I think I'm going to make it into a bobblehead. It's going to look exactly like the one currently on my dashboard. It's going to look like a Cyclops. But in my own heart, I'll know that was the Hydra I killed in this little Sidewinder. I hope you enjoyed the fight. I certainly enjoyed performing it. Have a good day and fly safe with Commanders. Commander Mechanab.